Hello and welcome to Flights in Alaska. I'm Dave. Today, we are once again in the Kenai Fjords National Park near the mouth of Resurrection Bay and just off of Box Island. You can see on my GPS here and then up to our left, that towering, towering island right here. And it's it's really beautiful in real life. And, uh, and I think this really does it justice. It kind of gives you a, a real taste of what this island looked like. Of course, a lot more rugged. Anyhow, for today's video, I thought what we'd do is we'd, we'd come out of Resurrection Bay and Fox Island and let's uh let's take a look here so this is again the kenai peninsula just to give you some context we're about uh, two and a half hours north by drive i'm sorry two and a half hours south by drive and then another maybe 45 minutes by water uh south of anchorage here so this is again resurrection bay the plan today is to come down here through this ialic cape and then into ialic bay up holgate arm over the holgate glacier and across the Harding Ice Field, and then down Tustamina Glacier, across Tustamina Lake, and then up the Kasilov River to the community of Kasilov here. So it's a bit of a long flight. I'll chop it up so that it's not super duper boring or extra, um, uh, extra, uh, you know, quiet or whatever. So let's see here. I'm gonna try to get us off the ground real quick, or off the water, I suppose, in this case, and then, and then I'll try to talk a little bit more about the area. All right, that'll do for now. So once again, we're in Resurrection Bay. I keep saying that. We are oops, experiencing some lag here. There we go. It's Fox Island. There's a little lodge out there. You can rent a cabin out there. I just kind of did a little bit of research to scope out what kind of price tag you're looking at for, for that kind of experience. And it's like $700 a person or so. Um, to come out here by cruise, expect to pay about $200 a person, give or take. Uh, and, and that's pretty much standard for, for most of the tour companies in this area. And they offer all kinds of other cool stuff, kayaking that sort of thing. So I just kind of wanted to point that out because I did mention it in the last video. And the main reason for this video today and coming down here the way we're coming across is because this is the direction that most tour companies um, will take. They'll come by Fox Island here. They usually run right through the middle of this of Resurrection Bay here between um, Rugged Island and Ialic. Uh, Ialic. Uh, it's not Ialic Cape. It's the... Um, yeah, Ialic Cape is down here. Doggone, Ialic Peninsula, holy moly. Um, but they'll kind of cut right through. This is a, an area called the Harding Gateway, and then this is here is Flying Sound, and that's where we're flying to right now. So let's see here. What else can I say about this right this very second? So again, wildlife in here. I said this in the last video. I'll repeat it. Uh, there's orcas, orca whales, as I say, killer whales, uh, sea lions, harbor seals, sea otters. All kinds of fish and birds galore. Puffins, you get puffins out here. Um, really pretty. We got the Bear Glacier coming down over here, Callisto Head, just to give you a bit more geography. Now, I'm not, as we proceed through here, I'm not going to uh, name everything. I think there's a lot of little islands and bays and things like that. Most of them have place names I could find, but um, but I'm going to leave leave it just for the most, most significant uh, features here. So again, I think I mentioned this again in the last video. This is, uh, in terms of Alaska Native people, this is traditional Aleutic territory. Uh, we've kind of passed out of the Denina lands, and we're going to head back into Denina Athabascan country by the end of this this video. So I'll try to try to pop up a few of the local indigenous names here as I can find them. I, I have I'm not so sure about place names around here. Most of these, you know, Fox Island, Rugged Island, these are pretty English names, and I doubt very much that they're translated from um, the local indigenous place names. Ialic Bay, I don't know, that sounds actually more like it comes from the Russian to me. I, I kind of looked it up to see if I could find an origin for Ialic Bay and I, I found nothing. So again, the reason that I picked this route here is that this is a common route taken at least up to the glaciers here by the local tour companies. And again, I don't think I just said it, you're gonna to expect to spend maybe a couple hundred bones to, to come out and do that per person. And, and I feel like it's fairly affordable. You know, they're, they're six to eight hour trips depending upon what you wanna do. And in this particular case, let's see here, we got the Holgate Glacier. That's where we're headed. That's the only one I've ever been to. I've been out here a couple of times. And then Ialic Glacier. And if you look on the tour company websites, they generally do not tell you which glacier they're going to. They say Tidewater Glacier. And those are the glaciers that come right down to the ocean and they big, big chunks of ice fall off. And the reason they do that is because 
if the weather isn't super duper great or it's pretty marginal and they can't move real fast, they'll, they'll come out here to Holgate, and that's where I've been. But if it's really nice and smooth sailing, they can move quick, they'll take you all the way out to Ialic Glacier instead, uh, which gives you more opportunity to see the wildlife and the landscape. I remember working in tourism. It was not super common that they used to do that, but that was 20 years ago, and I don't know if their equipment has changed or, or anything's changed that's allowed them to do that more often. But, but that's why if you go out to those, those tour companies and, and can't find out why um, why they won't tell you which glacier they're headed to, it's, it's kind of because of this. They're, they're sort of hedging their bets um, as far as what the weather's going to look like and what they're actually going to give you. And, and these guys really do try to give you the, the best experience in this area. A lot of these are pretty small companies, not always. But, uh, but several of them are at least started that way, and, and they want to make sure you, you have a good time to get your money's worth. Um, so you'll notice here I did not pick a nice, beautiful day. It went well overcast. And the reason I did this is because this area is so often sucked in. It is part of the rainforest, and so it, it gets a lot of rain and, and precipitation through here all throughout the year. And so if you come down here, odds are super duper good that this is how you're going to see it. Uh, you might see it clear on the horizon or more often you're going to see it dark and, and ugly down there big storms coming through and whatnot and that feels more like a spring and spring and fall time kind of deal i feel like when i've been out here and it's been overcast often you do kind of see these nice clear patches out there and this is what it looks like i think so again we're, we're headed towards ialic bay that's that's just on the other side here i don't have again any indigenous names to, to offer this time sadly i will a little bit later on but, but i don't right now Let's see, what, what else can we say about this area? Uh, it's really pretty in here. I can't say that. These islands are very, very rugged. I think I mentioned in the last video that this whole area was sort of messed up pretty bad by the 1964 Good Friday earthquake, which is like a 9.4, 9.6 earthquake that ravaged this area uh, and caused a pretty pretty significant tsunami that, that ran all the way even down into Oregon and California. I think even, even killed a few people down there, just to give you an idea about how, how significant that, that event was. Right now we can kind of see Ialic Glacier here, and I believe that's Peterson Glacier here. Uh, and that's Peterson with the S-E-N. And then Holgate Glacier up over here. Now I like how glaciers look when it's dark because I feel like you get, um, you know, when it's light and you've got bright sun, it just kind of glares back at you. And it's, you don't see a lot of the definition. It's just too bright. It's like looking at fresh, clean snow. Um, but you kind of get all this, this flat light gives you all this texture you can see in real life. I feel like the sim replicates that reasonably well. Let's see here, see if we can get a little bit closer. Not quite ready to to fast forward us up yet, but I do I do want to. So again, we're gonna go over that Holgate Glacier just off to our, our left there, I guess two o'clock position. Um, and that takes us straight over the Harding Ice Field and then down Tustamia Glacier. We don't, we don't really have to, to take too much of a too much of a diversion to get there, and we can do it all visually. It's fairly fairly easy to navigate if you're just kind of pointing in the right direction. It gets a little harder once we get to the other side and I'm looking for at Kasilov Airport. I, I think I've flown this route two or three times uh, prepping for this video, and and every time sort of struggled with that Kasilov Airport because it's not well done. So many of these small airstrips in the center are poorly represented, but they are there, which is great. It just means it takes a little bit more finesse to to get down uh, on the ground without crashing. Fortunately, this icon is pretty easy to, to fly and, and doesn't take a lot of runway once you're on wheels. Look at how pretty this is. These islands are all very, very rugged in real life. Just sometimes these little islands are just spires of rock sticking straight out like 500 feet in the air or something like that. Maybe not quite that high, I might exaggerate there, but I'm not sure what it looks like. And there is fishing out here. People come, you know, charter boats and that kind of stuff. They tend to go the other direction towards Prince William Sound, to our, to our east. Um, but but I have been out here a long time ago, halibut fishing. And that's the main uh, fishing that, that folks are doing out here. They're doing halibut, rockfish, lingcod, all kinds of rockfish, black rockfish or black bass, and then red rockfish. Also, what else do we get out here? You see sharks out here. Uh, skates, pull skates up sometimes. Um, let's see what else do we think about targeting wise. Oh, salmon, of course. Silver salmon derby is a big deal in the in Seward. When silver salmon are running, uh, moving in towards Seward in the fall time out in Resurrection Bay, there's a, a, a derby. They're looking for the largest fish or get the tagged fish. There's a, there's a prize. You buy tickets and so on. 
that's usually a big deal. I don't know what the status of that was this year with the pandemic and all that. I'm not sure if they did it. I haven't been watching. And I think, as I said in an earlier video, I've got a pretty, pretty good connection to Seward, and um, and that connection has kind of ebbed in the last handful of years, in part because my father-in-law, who does live there, has kind of been he's been more traveling in his retirement. He's kind of going out and seeing other parts of the state. He likes to fish over here on the other side. And, Kenai Peninsula, and we'll talk about some of those some of those general areas later on, in maybe subsequent videos. Maybe not so much here. So I did look at some recent pictures, and, and I would share them. But unfortunately, um, if it's not mine, I can't share it. That's just kind of how copyright works. But this glacier is fairly representative of some of the recent pictures I was able to find online. And if you go look at any of those tour companies, or just look at a Google Holgate Glacier or Ialic, and I'll just pop up Ialic right there for you so you can spell it. Um, that's how you say it is Ialic. Um, again, let me look to the right here. It's Ialic Bay, Ialic Glacier, Peterson Glacier there. And again, this is not one you could come up to right in the boat. And that's why tour companies like to come out here is that you can get right up against the glaciers and watch them, watch them calve. And, and they don't get super close, actually. It, it seems like you're right on top of the glacier, like it's no more than 100 feet away. But, but they actually kind of stay pretty far back because the large piece of ice comes down even for these large you know 120 200 passenger boats that could be pretty dangerous scene um you know it does throw up you know can throw up a pretty big wave and it'll rock the boat around but but nothing uh, they, they do stay far far enough back that it, it's not it's not exactly dangerous and i do think that that there's um companies that'll take kayaking trips up this direction as well i, I haven't actually investigated that very carefully i know there's kayaking um opportunities or, or charters that'll take you all over the place out here but this one again i was going to say the face of the face of the glacier where it you can kind of see that it almost looks like it's not all the way down this i think what's going on here these are little islands and the glacier's a little further back than this according to those most recent pictures i saw so this is pretty realistic compared to most of the other glaciers that we've seen so far in the sim it's uh this is much closer to reality and i do think this is still what we call a tidewater glacier as opposed to having receded up into into the harding ice field and kind of come more of a hanging glacier which which is sort of the fate of most of these places along the coast here is a lot of these old tidewater glaciers are not really tidewater anymore they're sort of moving back up the mountain valleys and sometimes you can get up in there with boats and sometimes not so much so again, this is, I feel like, fairly representative of what it looks like. It, it does do it justice, but it's not craggy enough remotely. What I do like is these slide areas here. The, see the rocks and stuff are, are, you know, being eroded down by, by weather and the elements and things, and they're kind of coming down on top of the snowpack. That looks pretty, pretty realistic. There's a really good one right here that um, no doubt got picked up by the imagery. Ugh, it's being blocked. I can't see it. Let that come into view. There it is, right? Just coming into view here. That is really authentic looking to me. So as we come up in here, we're going to get bumped around by the weather because uh, this is a flight simulator. And I feel like um, my experience in flying Alaska, big planes, small planes, whatever, is that if you're not experiencing turbulence, you may not be flying in Alaska. And granted, that's a huge generalization. Not totally true at all, but it sure feels like it. So I kind of want to uh, see if I can get a slightly better view of this glacier. You can kind of see how good that looks. All these little crevasses and crags and things like this so pretty and this is not a place you can really come to without a boat you got to take a boat out here or obviously a plane and get you there too and uh but you do see small craft will come up in here people with personal boats they'll, they'll come all the way up and check it out but look how good that is and that's even just above the water that's really what it's supposed to look like so thinking about any of the other glaciers we've talked about or looked at so far in this simulator in alaska i think this is possibly one of the best represented so far and what I've noticed in the sim as I've been flying around and trying to map out content for, for this channel is that the national parks, of which there are just a tremendous number in the state, I don't even know the number off the top of my head, but national parks and preserves across tend to have pretty good imagery that has been rendered into the game. It almost strikes me that you could do a, a national park tour in this game as well uh, across the country, and I suspect you'd have pretty darn good results. Look at this. These are just... This just looks really good. All these little hanging glaciers. I suspect some of these have names. I kind of looked some of them up, but it's an awful lot to memorize. And some of them just don't. 
So I'm not going to spend the whole time flying over the Harding Ice Field, but I am going to get up in there, and then we'll, we'll cut it up a little bit, and then and then we'll talk it when we get down to the Tustin Glacier, and maybe try to say a couple of things about that. But as we come into this, so again, here's another glacier here. This has a name, which I've forgotten. I did look it up. Um, the, the different maps I'm using to try to find place names and get them right to make sure I've got them straight um, has a couple of different layers, and I've been using the USGS topo layers. Uh, but this one came up on a different layer, and I don't know the source of that. I wish I wish I could tell you. Really, if you had something like a gazetteer, you know what that is. That's the best way to find place names in Alaska, and I don't have one, and they're not that they're not uh, they're not that cheap, as I recall. It's like over a hundred dollars to buy one of those things. Uh, I get them for work. I have them at work. Just can't uh, necessarily get one for personal use necessarily. So look at this nice textures. I love these textures here. Again, this, this sort of rock debris fall here. This is all very good looking. Northwestern Fjord is just on the other side here. That's another common destination for tour companies in this region. And I think that one's really popular for, for people who are into birding and uh, bird watching and then whatever. Yeah, so if you're into that, that'd be that'd be a place to maybe travel to. That, that trip out of Seward is a lot longer. Those tend to be more than eight hours and the, there's not as many amenities. I think they just get you out there as quick as possible. But, but they do feed you kind of a you know, deli lunch or something like this, most of these operators do. Yeah, so here we are coming onto the Harding Ice Field. According to what I could find, it's, it's the fourth largest ice field in North America and the largest one that's contained solely in the United States. Um, I think that's what it was. And the total, uh, hang on, I just totally forgot. I gotta look up the, the total uh, land mass here. Well. But it's got over 40 glaciers um, coming off of it, and uh, and it was the scene or the site of the filming of one of the Star Trek movies, the uh, Star Trek VI, the Undiscovered Country, that, that scene where they, they go to the Klingon ice planet. That was built up, filmed up here. I don't know where. I suspect probably to our north, closer to Seward and the Exit Glacier, there is a hiking trail you can take and if you go to the National Park Service website they do have um, instructions on how to get up there and what to expect and what they expect of you and all those kinds of things and it's really cool but you have to be super fit you're basically climbing up the side of the mountain to get up there and it does take all day but it's apparently pretty pretty cool experience I've never done it myself and maybe it's not as intense as it sounds but if you read the National Park Service website that's they make it seem like it's a it's a pretty pretty big deal. So the Harding Ice Field in size is about 700 square miles, and more like a thousand if you include all the glaciers that come up. But again, there's about 40 of them, and I'm not 100% sure what all they're counting. They're counting stuff like these little hanging glaciers up here that kind of terminate right up in the high valleys, or or what. I mean, you could probably call this a glacier by itself too. I don't really know how they how they distinguish those or how they count them up. But I do know a bunch of them just don't have names you're going to be able to find easily, if at all. Not a whole lot of historical note for this particular ice field. It was kind of ignored by everybody until fairly recently. And it's just a big, big field of ice. Not a whole lot if you're into trapping and fishing and logging, which are all the historical things that, that white settlers were into. Or, um, you know, if you're into subsistence, which is to say you, you're, you're um, harvesting food from the land, wild food, and that's your deal. This is not also a particularly helpful location for, for you to engage in those activities. And these here are the Kenai Mountains we're flying through here. I believe they're part of the Chugach range. I kind of get confused with, with mountain uh, mountain naming stuff because you've got the range, and then you've got the mountains. It's like, well, what the heck are we going to name? Uh, and then sources are not always consistent either. Wikipedia I found is kind of inconsistent when it comes to how local folks call places. Uh, but but that might just be me more than um, Wikipedia actually me not being as familiar with geography as I sort of imagined I was So with that in mind, I'm gonna break this right now Otherwise this video is gonna be like two hours long and, and that just doesn't sound like much fun to me watching a glacier slide by and listen to Dave talk for two hours about nothing um, So I'll, uh, I'll catch up with you as you get a bit closer down to the Tustamina glacier there
at this point, I, I wanted to come back to, to show some things off here, to talk about the glacier and the lake, again, Tustin the Glacier and Tustin the Lake, and then this is Glacier River. There's a gazillion of those in the state. Um, right here, we see these rocks. There seems to be this pattern of outflows. They had a big river wash over, and it did, river of ice. This geographic pattern here is a geologic pattern. I don't know if the right word is, is actually from when the glacier, once upon a time, this Tustamina Glacier, Tustamina Glacier, was way up here, and it was pushing down and grinding all this rock down out of the mountains and, and into the valley here. So that's what that's from. If you're not familiar with glacier, glaciers, you can see this kind of feature all around things like ice fields and that kind of stuff. Sometimes they're covered up with trees and this kind of stuff, but, but not in this case. Oh man, look at that. Wow, that looks good, that little detail there. Sorry, I just wanted to point that out because it looked great. So, yeah, I just wanted to, to stop and point that out. So Tustamina uh, Glacier is about 25 miles long and again comes out of the Harding Ice Field, which we just went over. And it empties into the Tustamina Lake. And the Alaska native name for Tustamina Lake is, which is to say the Denina Athabascan indigenous, indigenous name is Dustu Bena. Uh, and what that means is Point Lake. And I don't... I don't know. I don't have any context to help us out understand what Point Lake means, but but uh, if we look down on our GPS here, went over the glacier. There we go. Um, maybe I'll zoom out just a little bit. There's this Caribou Island, and it kind of looks like a point. My my guess, which is probably totally wrong and absolutely uh, has no base in reality, whatever, is that maybe it has something to do with this, this pointy pointy island there. So Tustamina lake is the third largest lake on the Kenai Peninsula and the eighth largest lake in the state of Alaska. It's very large. It's very deep. It's 950 feet deep at its deepest, which is actually deeper than Cook Inlet, way out ahead of us there. And it's about 73,000, almost 74,000 acres, uh, 25 miles long um, and about six miles wide at its wide widest. Of course, the, the primary inflow is this, this glacier here, and then there's some, some other creeks and streams and, and rivers that all flow in here and, and help feed it. And the major outflow is the, the Kasilof River, which is a popular salmon fishing destination as well. Now, this is inside the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, not, not too unlike the uh, Skelak Lake to the north there, on to our right. Uh, this one, unfortunately, though, is not accessible by road. If you want to get out here, you're going to take it by boat, or by plane and thinking about boating it's it's a dangerous lake uh, you get these high winds that come off the glacier that don't seem to be bothering us now in the same which is kind of cool but but those winds will blow up and frequently and you see this on these glacial mountain you know lakes like this is that they're deep and you know they can really get some high dangerous waves on them and so they're really just dangerous and it'll come up the wind will come up suddenly really unexpectedly it might be clear and calm one minute the next minute you're swamped so so this is a pretty pretty dangerous place to come out and i don't really know what the recreation looks like in this area whether you do get a lot of boaters out here and, uh, and that kind of stuff you're not going to come out here in a uh, in a canoe i don't think it wouldn't be safe i guess you could i would not i would not advocate for that kind of thing now, through here, the imagery that we're seeing is kind of a mixed bag. I feel like it's good stuff. Like, this looks good. Just, actually, that looks really good. It's not as rugged as it ought to be. But boy, it sure is darn close. This is, I think, the closest I've seen anything be yet. This, the rock here like this, that's that's what I'd expect to see. And again, you have this sort of pattern developed by the glaciers thousands and thousands of years ago. Um, sort of scraping, kind of everything moving in the, the same direction kind of deal. So let's see, now we are looking out over the Kenai Peninsula, uh, west towards those mountains across the way, which I am struggling with the name of. I don't know that I, I use a name for this mountain range up here. I've seen it on maps charted as the the northern tip of the Aleutian Range, and I've heard people describe it as part of the, the Alaska Range. I, I actually don't know. I'm kind of looking for, for for the correct source on that, but, but one chunk over here is called the Nicola Mountains, and Lake Clark National Park and Preserve is on that side. There's the, the, all the volcanoes we talked about are over there, and we'll take a closer look at that a little bit later on, and I'll do the research to give proper names um, on this stuff. I just don't, I just don't quite remember. So out of, in front of us again, there's Caribou Islands, and then we're headed kind of that direction. That's where the 
uh, Kasilov River comes out. And you can kind of tell by the names through here that there's a lot of Russian influence in this region um, until fairly recently. And, and even even to this day, there's still quite a bit of that Russian influence. And again, that's, that's for a later video. I've got some things to say about that. And again, like so many of these lakes that we've seen so far, this is just this bright turquoise color throughout. And this renders fairly well in the sim. That's pretty, pretty nice. And the, the land through here looks fairly true to life as well. I've never flown over this part of the state. I've, I've of course, flown over further south here. Um, I'm almost embarrassed to admit I've never driven down even as far in the Kenai Peninsula on this side. Again, when you're close, you live closest to a place, it's sometimes hard to prioritize that. But with that, I think we've probably seen about as much of uh, the Tustamina Lake as we can really stomach for the moment. So I'm going to fast forward us up to that uh, Kasilov River there and past our Caribou Island, and, and we'll come back and sort of talk a little bit more and slow down the, the flight a little bit so we can we can watch some of the some of the landscape roll by. past Caribou Island there in Tustamina Lake, I thought we'd slow it down again and start talking about the area or saying a few things here and there. So to start with, we're going to follow this Kasilov River. That's what this is here. It goes all the way from Tustamina Lake here. It's the major outflow of Tustamina Lake all the way out to, to Cook Inlet. That's where it heads. But we're going to we're gonna kind of turn right a little bit before then and see if we can't get this aircraft down on a runway. I have actually tried this a gazillion times, and that runway is goofy and it's hard to get into and it's super duper duper hard to see but we're going to try it anyways because this is not just a tour uh it's also a flight sim so i want to try to do that too so thinking about the local Tanina athabasca name for this this is kasalatnu and i apologize if i butcher that that g sound i think is way in the back of the throat if i'm reading the Tanina topical dictionary right so what that means is something point i don't uh there's nothing in the in the book to really help explain it uh, I'm sorry, something stream point. I don't know where I got point from. Losing my mind. Yeah, something stream. And again, that, that ending new is, is means flowing water, I think. I'm pretty sure that that's what that, that means. Anytime you see, most of the time you see river in this area, it ends in new. And, and I believe that's specific to this region's dialect of Denina. And there are other place names. We could probably dredge up from Denina dictionary but um but those th this river i think is the one that really is, is worth anything right now uh, i think i'd have a hard time pointing out anything else that that was named in particular now this area again this is not road connected the only way to get up into here is by boat it, the imagery was done in the springtime i think and so we're going to see some spots where there's stuff frozen up and stuff that's not frozen and that's pretty cool looking I think and I think it's really cool because I wanted to show that off because it does look realistic and most people when they come up to Alaska to visit it's it's in the summertime and you don't see that but when you live here and you travel around and go into remote places sometimes you, you do you do get to see that and I, I always thought it's cool it's kind of fun to watch to see which which lakes are frozen and which ones are thawed and see the little 
chunks floating around. You can actually kind of see here in the Kasilov River, there's bits of ice all along the edges here. That's what's going on in there. At least I think. I don't think that this lake has got a lot of yeah, algae or anything like that in it. So, yeah, that's all ice, you can tell. All right, try not to crash. Follow the, follow the river here. I'll maybe try to head a little bit north of the runway and come in it from the not north, I guess west of the runway, so we can't come in closer to something from the, the southeast as opposed to the southwest. There's a, there's a ridge or something there, and it makes it super ridiculously hard to see. And I just struggle. And of course, the light doesn't help either. And it's, it's you know, in the sim, there's all these runways that get rendered in. There's some 32,000 or something ridiculous like this. But so many of those are these strips that are just really impossible to do anything with. Um, but I have definitely landed this this aircraft there once or twice. I think it was probably more beginner's luck than anything. So there's some of that that I was talking about, this muskeggy stuff here. And I don't remember if I was talked about muskeg before, but it's this kind of swampy stuff that's like moss and grass, and it's super wet. It's basically like if you could jump on it, it would be like a waterbed, except that you also sink in too. So this kind of stuff is full of berries and all kinds of all kinds of stuff. Moose like to hang out in, in these kinds of areas and, and eat the eat the, the mosses and the whatever it is that grows in there. It's their summertime forage. Now, thinking about wildlife, actually, moose, there's moose all throughout here, obviously. I mean, obviously, but but that's that's the, one of the um, major wa wildlife out here. You also get bears, of course, black bears and brown bears, both in this area. Alaska is known for that. And then also caribou. This region has four caribou herds. And those are, let me read them off, there's the Kenai Mountain herd of about 250 or so animals, maybe maybe pushing 400. The Kenai Lowland herd, which is, you know, more like 130, 150 animals, something like this. And then the Kili River herd with numbers around 250. And then the Fox River herd, which is fewer than 100. Now, caribou in this area were hunted out, I think, in the early 1900s. And, and then they were reintroduced by the National Park Service again. Looking off to our right here, this is Kenai National Wildlife Refuge back behind us there. And so the, the National Park Service reintroduced in the 1960s and the 1980s. And now that these are the herds that we have. And you can you can hunt these. Uh, I think that it's not uh, really open to non-Alaska residents, but I'm not 100% sure about that. What I do know is it's a drawing. So if you wanted to hunt in this area, you'd have to Put in for it. You have to put in for a lottery system. Basically, you pay fifteen or twenty dollars or something like this to fish and game, and then they put you in for for that drawing. And if you get it, you can come down here and and hunt caribou. And it's convenient because it, it is on the road system. That the Sterling Highway kind of runs north south through here. Again, the Sterling Highway comes out of Soldotna. I think this is it right here. Actually, I think that's generally where we're headed. Uh, it's this bend in the road. I think the runway is right along there. This runs down south to Anchor Point and Homer around that hill there. And this area, it's not very populous. A lot of these houses and things you see in here, in fact, not necessarily houses. There are a lot of uh, recreational cabins in this area, and that's what we see, uh, I think, the most out here. Now, I might be somewhat wrong about that, but my recollection is that this Kasilov area is not very populous. And we're talking, you know, some hundreds of hundreds of residents, and or maybe the low thousands. Uh, but it, but it's also very spread out. Now, this river, um, a popular fishing river for sockeye salmon or red salmon as we call them and at the mouth here so this is Kalifornsky Beach and there's a road Kalifornsky Beach Road that runs up along there and there uh, you can actually do two kinds of uh, what we call personal use fishing one is uh, for with set net uh, and that's a bit of a it's a difficult um, that's a difficult thing to go do because it's very popular and there are people who've been doing it for years and they kind of get uh, they get cranky with folks who are who are coming to try that and and are not really part of the part of the community and and so that makes it tough. Um, but again, it's not open for non-residents, anyways. And then also in that mouth area, you can you can dip net, and so you can come up and hear the giant like four foot across or six foot across or something like this dip net. That um, uh, that's a little bit easier to do. People get a little less cranky about that kind of stuff. And again. For both of those fisheries, they're the same, so you can't fish both of them. You can do one or the other. You can do both, but your limit is 25 salmon per household, and then more depending upon how many people live with you. And so, you know, sockeye salmon, they're, they're uh, you know, four and a half pounds of meat per fish. So, you know, 25, that gets you 100 pounds of, 
really good quality salmon and it really is pretty out there but again like this whole area that that all those flats off to the, the left there those are those are generally not as green as they look they are kind of up higher they're green and grassy but but down low it's it's those mud flats again so here we are i, I found the runway this time uh, i was using my gps a little more thoroughly let's see if i can actually land this thing and i've been struggling because i feel like every time i try to bring this in I, i've not been able to uh the landing gear hasn't come down for some reason the last time it didn't come down and the first time i tried it this today the landing gear didn't come down and so i had a little bit of an accident coming i think I, this time we might actually make it so for the next video i don't think i'm going to try to take off out of here necessarily i think what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit north we're going to go out of the kenai municipal airport just one more time and and this time we're going to go north i think to um to another region of the state and uh, we'll pass out of Cook Inlet there for a little while, and then and then we'll come back and go go back uh, to our travel south, and, and uh, in future videos head towards Kodiak Island and that sort of thing. So here we go. Let's see if I remember to put the landing gear down properly. I press the button. Let's see if this worked here. Let's see if Dave's a pilot or uh, or not today. Oof. Come on, come on down. Oop, we got it. Oof, that was a rough, 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 rough landing. All right, cool. Well, thanks for hanging out with me through that that little mess. Um, I uh, I do appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video and the content, hit that like button. If you want to see more of these videos and and follow me as I explore Alaska, hit subscribe. And and if you want to know just when it happens, uh, hit that notification bell. Uh, otherwise, thank you so very much, and I'll see you in the next video.